Okay, good evening, everyone. Okay, so welcome to our first uh, 2401 lecture. All right, my name is Mr. Ravi. Okay, so I'll be the module coordinator uh, for this and the lecturer, I'll be handing both the lectures and the tutorials all right, for this module. Uh, the labs, uh, there'll be some uh, lab exercises, but they are basically things that you can do at home uh, using uh, software that you will download. All right, so I'll talk uh, about all of that along the way. All right, so once again, welcome. Um, so I know it's a uh, working day and uh, for many of you, you're already back to uh, maybe working uh, physically back at office. All right, some of you are still at home. Okay, uh, so for this module, um, we still opted to go with the uh, online version, okay, through Zoom because of the numbers, all right? So the initial numbers that we were expecting were around 60 plus. All right, currently, I think we have about 50 old students enrolled. Okay, some may be joining us uh, maybe after this week. Okay, so with the current uh, safe man management measures we have in school, uh, going through online is still the uh, better option. All right, for the classes. Okay, uh, hopefully by the end of this semester, things are back to normal, you know, and maybe from uh, next time onwards, uh, all of us can be back on campus. Okay, um, so I just had an announcement on this that all um, our recordings, uh, all lectures will be recorded, all right, and will be uploaded. Okay, so uh, of course, uh, I still strongly encourage everyone to attend it live. Okay, uh, I think it's a lot better, and um, uh, at least you you get to absorb some uh, things along the way. All right, even though you're tired, you just finish work and so on, and then later on you just see the recording to sort of recap and you know, what you have uh, already listened earlier on. All right, if you totally miss it, then uh, you know when you see the recording, everything is new. All right, and uh, generally what happens is. Uh, a, a two and a half hour lecture recording uh, gets dragged on to five hours, all right? Because you watch a bit, you pause, you watch a bit, you pause, you know, in between you watch Netflix, in between you message your friends, you know? So, um, so things get delayed more and more, all right? So it's always better if you can uh, attend it live, all right? But whatever the case, there is always the recordings for you to, to fall back on, okay? For the revision and uh, everything. Okay, so let me uh, share my screen. Okay, and then we'll get started with the lecture. So I already uploaded the slides uh, for this week's lecture. So every week I will uh, upload the material, all right, uh, by the weekend. So uh, you can have a look at it, all right? Uh, and uh, if you have time, you can prepare. If not, you just come to class and then we can have a discussion. Okay, so let me uh, share my screen. Um, give me a minute. Okay, can everybody uh, see my screen here? Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, just a few things, uh, if along the way, anytime um, I get disconnected, uh, because sometimes my Wi-Fi uh, again uh, has some issues. So if I get disconnected, uh, just stay on the Zoom call, okay? Uh, I will be able to join back in and then we can resume. All right, uh, if at any point of time, uh, for some reason, you can't see me, you can't uh, hear me, you know, uh, then uh, you can let me know by calling me. Uh, okay, I'll share my number in a while. All right, so this is just to prevent the repeat of, uh, I'm sure you all know the incident. I think there's one, one prof who went ahead the two hour lecture and then uh, only then realized that, uh, that nobody could hear him. All right, uh, so I do not want a repeat of that. Okay, so along the way, anything goes wrong, uh, you can always contact me. All right, so uh, so welcome back to this uh, semester. All right, so this module, Introduction to Computer System, PIC 2401, is uh, one of the core modules, okay, for the degree program, okay? Uh, and I've been teaching this module ever since it started. All right, that means you are like the uh, fourth batch, I think, yeah, of uh, students that I'm teaching. All right, um, so I think maybe the good news first is uh, until now, uh, I never had failures until last semester, I mean the last uh, batch of students. And the only reason why uh, there were some failures is because those students, I think they 
wanted to drop the module, but they didn't or something, you know. So they did not submit any assignment. They did not show up for the exam. You know, so basically there was nothing to, to grade. All right, so they ended up failing. But other than that, uh, uh, all the students before who have always submitted the assignments, came for the exam and did it, you know, uh, all have passed. All right. So I think that is something that is, uh, I think, a good news. All right. So as long as you are consistent, you, you keep up with the work, all right, uh, there is sufficient help along the way, you will definitely clear the module. All right. So I know um, uh, part time studies is always very tough. All right, most of you are a family, you have young kids and so on. All right, so to manage all of that with the studies and your full-time job is always a challenge. All right, so uh, rest assured, okay, you have enough support all right, to, to uh, go through this module. And I've also structured it such that uh, you don't have too much of stress along the way, but you still need to have a bit of consistency in keeping up with the work. All right, so you can complete the assignments on time. Okay, so... Uh, so my name is Saravi, all right? So this is my office, uh, but I don't think uh, even myself, I only go back to office like twice a week uh, for now, all right? Uh, so this is my handphone number, so you can take note of it. Uh, along the way, anything you need to clarify, you want to ask questions, you can always WhatsApp me, all right? So this is my email, okay? Uh, so generally, uh, for most students, you know, uh, ad hoc questions, simple clarifications, they will just WhatsApp me, I will just reply, okay, uh, once I'm free, okay, but if it's a lengthy, uh, maybe question or something that is really not clear, then you can send me an email and then I can probably type it out to uh, uh, send a response there, all right, so uh, that is from the, the usual way in which uh, most students interact with me, all right, so all my undergraduate students and uh, you all as well, everybody usually just messages me if there's anything. All right, so all the course materials are on Luminous. Okay, everything will be uploaded uh, weekly basis. All right, so this is just to make sure you don't get overloaded with too much of material at one time. All right, so I just do it weekly so it's easier for you to manage. Okay, so the objective of this uh, module has uh, two parts. So uh, basically, uh, this module 2401 is a combination of, um, uh, I would say, Two different modules, all right, in, in the undergraduate level. Okay, so, I, so this first part here is basically what we call the module of the computer architecture. Okay, so there is one full module, okay, uh, in uh, us in our undergraduate course called CS2100. Uh, so that covers very in depth the entire uh, architecture of a processor. All right, that means what exactly happens at the very low level, how the processor deals with instructions, what is assembly language coding and everything. All right, so that is of course a full-fledged course, all right, uh, by itself. So we have taken like half of it and we have combined it with another module, which is on operating systems. All right, so this is also another module that I teach, uh, 2271 Real-Time Operating Systems. They have another CS version as well. All right, so this is about how you can design multi-threaded applications, how operating system works, how do you design software with multiple threads that can talk to each other, how do you share data safely, you know, so all these important concepts. All right, so it is like a, a half of two different modules put together, okay, to give you a good breadth of these uh, concepts. All right, so you will see that you are covering a lot of things, all right, but enough to make sure that you have a good understanding of it. Right, so again, these are just some of the topics that we'll be covering, so I will not go through too much of it. Okay, we'll, we will look at it when we come to that. Okay, so the assessment wise. All right, so uh, in terms of the assessment, we have uh, labs. Okay, so this labs, basically you have two lab assignments. Okay, so assignment one and assignment two. Okay, so each will be 15%. Okay, and uh, each of it will be on uh, the two different areas of focus. So one of it will be on the uh, MIPS architecture uh, design. Okay, the other one will be on the uh, OS design. All right, so these are fairly, uh, I would say, manageable assignments. All right, you have, you, I will discuss them more when we cover those topics. All right, uh, but rest assured, you have more than enough time to work on it. All right, so uh, these are two assignments you need to do. All right, 
Um, then the term paper. So in the in the past, we used to have a midterm, but I've since replaced it with a term paper. So I think it's easier because then you don't have so much of uh, stress of trying to study for a test midway through the semester. Uh, so a term paper is a bit more, I would say, relaxing. So you just uh, go through the term paper and prepare your, your solution, all right, and then you, you submit. All right? uh, so that, again, we will discuss more on, on it uh, at a later time. So this one, again, is uh, on the first part of the MIPS uh, design. And then we have a final exam. All right? uh, so for the last uh, two semesters, it has been luminous based, okay, online quiz. Uh, this semester, again, uh, let's wait and see how things go. All right, so I will not confirm it now. Let's wait and see how, all right? So if uh, things go back to normal along the way, we might have it face-to-face uh, -face on campus. If not, we will stick with the online uh, examination. All right, so I'll update this at a later time. Okay, so this is my YouTube channel, all right? Uh, so generally all my classes, the videos, I upload them directly to YouTube. Okay, so I think it's easy for anybody to access. All right, so all the video recordings of the previous um, uh, classes are also there. Okay, not only for this uh, 2401, all my other modules that I teach in uh, NUS as well is all there. All right, so you can go and uh, subscribe or you can just have a look. All right, and you can uh, see for yourself the, the uh, recordings. All right, but our recordings also, I will release the Zoom recording as well as the uh, YouTube link okay, once I upload. Okay, so that is the end uh, for just the introduction part. Okay, so uh, along the way, uh, feel free to ask questions if you have any. All right, uh, you can either put it in the chat, okay, uh, or you can uh, unmute and, and ask me as well. Okay, so don't feel shy about asking any questions. Okay, so let me go on to the next set of slides. Okay, so um, so we're going to get started with the first half of the uh, uh, module. Okay, like I said, so the, that first half is to give us a better understanding of what exactly is a processor, what is uh, are the internals of it. Okay, uh, how do you design this architecture, and how uh, a high-level program actually gets broken down until to a point where that low level hardware can execute your instructions. All right. So it is a very interesting uh, sort of uh, first half of the module. Okay. Uh, because I think this is probably uh, the only module where you will learn this or discuss these concepts. I think every other module you will probably uh, be at a very high level. All right, so this is the only module where we are going into it at a very low level. Because okay, it's equivalent for our uh, full-time undergraduate students as well. The 2100 module is the only module where they actually go uh, into this uh, hardware level. All right. Uh, so it is interesting, uh, but of course some of you may think, okay, why do I need to study this? You know, uh, I really don't need this. I'm programming at a high level. Okay, but we feel that this is an important concept you need to understand. All right, and I will, I will relate to it a bit later on. Okay, once you study it, all right, then I'll relate, come back to this and relate to it as to see why uh, we need to do this. Okay, so there's a question here, is multi-threading taught in Java? So everything is in C. All right, so the first part also, we will talk a bit about C and then an assembly language and in the multi-threading, we will also go into C. All right. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me get started with this. Uh, Okay, so the introduction. Okay, so let's just have a quick review of uh, some of the programming languages, uh, what is C, and exactly what is a computer system or a computer organization system. All right. So in terms of programming languages, uh, 
you already have uh, done uh, some basic modules. So can I just have a quick understanding uh, in your earlier semesters, which language did you all learn? Was it C or Python or Java? C++, okay. So good. All right, so if you know C++, basically you know C as well. All right, so it's just that we don't go into object oriented, all right, but we stick with uh, procedural. All right, and then when we go on to the OS part, we will look at it from the multi-threading as perspective. All right, so it's good. So I think in that sense, uh, all of you are in, in a good uh, sort of foundation, all right, to, to take this course. All right, so from when you talk about programming language, okay, there are of course many, many different languages. And when you talk about programming language, we are basically giving instructions to a computer to solve a particular problem for us. Okay, now, uh, so what actually is happening, all right? So at a very high level, all right, so whichever module you took, whether you took it in C, Java, Python, C++, whatever, you, you write code at a very high level, okay, something like this, all right? So you, you write declare variables, you, you write loops, uh, you have if-else statements or whatever, all right? But once uh, you click on the button that says build the code or compile the code, okay, so what happens? It gets translated first, all right, to some assembly language code. All right, so this is the first half of what we're going to be studying. How do we translate this very high level code, okay, into what we call assembly language code. So this assembly language code is very specific to the architecture of the processor we are dealing with, all right. So these instructions that you see, add i, add uh, beq, and so on. So these are all specific to the, uh, processor that we deal with, okay? If I run this on a mixed processor, I have a set of instructions. If I run it on an ARM processor, I have a different set of instructions and so on, all right? So this will depend on the architecture of the processor, all right? But eventually, okay, at the assembly language level, it is like a intermediary, all right? It is something that is very specific, but at the same time, it is readable, all right? So once you know this language, you can read it, you can understand, and you know what is happening. But at the lowest level, okay, what the actual hardware sees is actually machine code, which is ones and zeros. Okay, so we need to be able to eventually translate, all right, uh, this high level code, okay, to ones and zeros. All right, so that is where this intermediary step of the uh, assembly language coding comes in. All right, so we're going to be looking at all of that. Uh, so just a bit of background in C is that, Okay, it's basically an imperative procedural language okay, that allows us to uh, write code quite efficiently. And one of the reasons, okay, so even though uh, it has been uh, created so many years back, okay, uh, it is still one of the most widely used languages uh, for many different applications, especially uh, for what we call embedded devices, all right, or devices that uh, run close to hardware. All right, and the reason is because C is something that is able to very closely match okay, the machine level code that we are dealing with. All right, so it has a lot of very powerful features all right, that still make it a preferred choice for many different uh, applications, okay, even up till now. Okay, so, uh, so this part, I think we will not go through too much. All right, I think this step you sort of know, you first create your edit your source code, you compile it. When you compile it, you create object code. All right, so object code is basically, in a sense, something like your machine code, but then you need, still need to link it together with other object codes. Okay, so this other object codes could be from other files, or it could be from other libraries and so on. And then that is the job of the linker. And eventually everything comes together and you have an executable code. Right, so, th so these are the steps. All right, uh, of course, again, all of this is sort of transparent to us most of the times because uh, the ID that we use generally takes care of uh, all these uh, steps for us. Uh, so in terms of abstraction, like we mentioned, okay, we are trying to understand how a high level program, okay, gets translated to assembly language and eventually to the machine language. All right, so this is what we are aiming to understand, all right, in the first half of this module. Now, in terms of the abstraction layers, okay, what do we have? All right, so if you take an application software, for example, okay, so let's take what I'm running now. Let's say I'm running 
uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, all right, running Zoom. So these are all applications of a very high level. All right, and these are all running on my computer, all right, which is running the Windows system, all right, Windows OS. So the Windows OS is sort of being used as a way to manage the resources that my application software needs. All right, so whatever resources that my PowerPoint application needs, my Zoom needs, everything is going through the operating system and the operating system is managing it for me. All right, so when I uh, run my software, all right, uh, when I build it, of course I compile, assemble and link it, but when I eventually run it, the OS helps me to manage the resources that I need. Now, how about at the lower level? Eventually I know that whatever software I'm running uh, or executing right now is running on the processor on my board. Okay, so in my case, it's a, a Intel i7, all right? So it's running on that processor core. I have some memory, I have my input output system, which is my keyboard, which is my monitor, and so on, all right? So I have this low level hardware that is still uh, on my PC, all right? So how do all of these systems interact with each other? So there must be a way for some data flow to be there to control the flow of information, to control these systems, and so on. And this translates to even more lower level hardware, but right? digital logic design, the hardware. If you go even deeper, you're talking about transistors and resistors and so on, all right? Coming down to the circuit level design. All right, so you can go very, very deep, okay? To a very low hardware level, all right? So you have software on one side and you have hardware on the other side, all right? So what is in between? This in between is basically what we call the instruction set architecture. All right, which translates all right, the code that we write to the hardware that we are going to run it on. All right, so this in-between layer, this instruction set architecture is basically the, uh, what we call the assembly language programming all right, that will be able to translate this high level software to this low level hardware. All right, so that is where this ISA comes in, all right, which we will be learning in this course. So that is where we are coming from. So we want you to understand and appreciate what is actually happening. All right. So like I said, this is a very unique uh, course because like I said, this is the only place where you will learn this. Okay, you will never touch, uh, I mean, unless you take some electives later on that are focused on maybe computer architecture or so on, then you may come back to this. But if not, you this is probably the only module where you will learn all this lower level stuff, all right? And uh, again, it is important, all right, because uh, as a software developer, uh, I think there is always this understanding that the same software will run differently on different platforms, different hardware, all right? So if you take a piece of software and you run it on different hardware, you get different uh, performance, all right? The, the outcome may be the same, but the performance is different, all right? And that plays a part, all right? So why uh, this is important is because we need to understand why uh, this hardware plays a part okay, uh, on the performance of the software. Okay, uh, so again, the operating system, we will be covering that and the instruction set architecture with the low level uh, design of the hardware is also what we will be covering. All right, so again, these are all the abstraction levels. I will not go through this again, just to give you an idea of uh, what we're talking about. Right, so in terms of computer organization, like I said, why we want to understand this is because we want to uh, understand this level of abstraction. So what is actually happening? All right, so you are able to do C++ programming, you can compile, you run, you create all these very, very wonderful applications. But what is actually happening at the back end? All right, so that is what we want the students to understand. All right, so that is this module together with the operating systems. All right, so again, we want students to understand the, the main idea or the focus is the hardware and software play a part. Okay, so even though you can write very fantastic software, everything is good, okay, you must also understand that the underlying hardware plays a big uh, role in how the software will be executed. All right, so if you have hardware that can match up with the software that you have uh, written, then everything goes well together. And you have a very, very good overall performance. All right, so that is the objective of this uh, first half of the module, all right, where we're going to be talking about the 
of the architecture part. All right, so again, before we go on, just, just to give you maybe some real life example, if you look back at uh, about two years back when uh, Apple launched the M1 series, correct? Okay, uh, the, there was of course uh, a, a lot of uh, hype about it, and it did show that there was a lot of uh, improvement in their own software. Right, so Apple's own software showed a tremendous improvement when it was run on the new M1 processor compared to the earlier processors that they had. All right, but it took time for other organizations or other companies to release their own updated version okay, that could match the M1's architecture. All right, so if you had tried to run an older version of a software on the M1 processor, either it wouldn't work or it wouldn't be able to show you the same level of performance. All right, so, so that's a, a real world example. All right? So even though Apple came out with this fantastic M1 chip, all right, it doesn't straight away mean that everybody's software is going to work well on it. All right, so like Microsoft uh, had to release their own updated version of Office that could be that was optimized. All right, to make full use of what M1 was able to offer. Okay, so so that is a, a clear example to show you that you know you, you can have very good software or you can and you can have very good hardware, but both must sort of link up together. Then the overall performance is good. If just one side is good, but the other side is not able to fully utilize uh, the features available, then you are not going to get the performance that you are hoping to get. Okay? Yeah, so, so that is the, the motivation behind why we want you to learn this stuff. Okay, so uh, let me move on. Uh, again, don't worry, it's not I'm going too fast or anything. I think this is all just general stuff. So uh, I just sort of going through a bit faster. Okay, when it comes to the actual more technical content, I will not go at this pace. Huh? I will definitely slow down to make sure everybody sort of uh, understands and is able to follow. All right, so this is just some basic introduction stuff. So I'm just I'm going at a bit uh, faster pace. Okay, so, uh, so for today's, uh, okay, so generally uh, the plan, okay, if you look at our schedule, Okay, if you look at our schedule, uh, all classes start at uh, 6 30 p.m. up to 9 30 p.m. And the uh, timetabling shows that 6 30 to 7 30 is a tutorial and 7 30 to uh, 9 30 is lecture. Okay, but why I said that all our classes will always start at 6 30 is because, uh, okay, the reason why they actually speed up that way is uh, in some uh, other modules where the class size is quite big, they speed up. Uh, into many different tutorial classes, all right, which are handled by uh, graduate students. Okay, so to make it easier for the graduate students, they let the let them finish up the tutorial first, and then they have the lectures later. All right, but in our case, uh, I'm handling both the lectures and the tutorials. All right, so how I will run is we will go through lectures first, and as and when I feel that we have covered enough material, then we will have a tutorial slot. All right, so the tutorial may start at 6.30, may start at 7.30, or may start at 8 o'clock, okay, depending on how uh, you progress. All right, so I think it's a lot better this way, all right, so we don't have to stick to a particular schedule. We just start every class at 6.30, and then uh, along the way, when I think that, okay, it's time that we can have a tutorial maybe next week, then we'll schedule one. Okay, uh, so for today's plan, I mean, it's the first week, okay, uh, the first lecture, so I still don't want to uh, overload you too much, all right? So we will ease you into the start of the semester as well, all right? Uh, so I will cover lecture two plus a bit of lecture three on number systems, and we can probably have a earlier uh, end time today, okay? And then uh, next week onwards, we will probably uh, stretch it a bit more, okay? Uh, generally, what I will do is I will usually have uh, class every, 45 minutes or 15 minutes, and then you'll have a 10 minutes break. I think so that sort of gives you time to relax. Okay, and then come back in again. All right. Um, yeah, so I hope this kind of uh, arrangement works. Uh, again, I know everybody is, uh, some of you may still be traveling in the train or bus back home right now, okay, and still listening to me all the way. Okay, so, um, so I, uh, you just try to adjust and um, uh, again, if you miss the classes or anything, you just uh, watch the recordings and uh, hopefully you can catch up. All right. And if you still have doubts about anything, you can always uh, 
you know, contact me and you can discuss. All right, so let me start and then go through this lecture two first. All right, and since all of you have already done C++, I think this will be a breeze for you. Okay, but we will just go through uh, to sort of uh, have a quick recap of some basic concepts. Okay, so just to make sure everybody uh, remembers everything well. All right, so C programming. All right, so again, uh, let me just do a quick uh, poll. All right. Uh, so I think everybody has used poll everywhere before. So you just need to open up your handphone uh, browser and go to this web link, pollev.com. Okay. And then uh, submit your replies here. Okay, so you can just be honest about it. Huh? I'm not tracking any names or anything. Okay, so about half of you have uh, replied. Okay, so generally, okay, most of, about half of you say, okay, okay, which I think is, is good, all right. Um, for this module, I can say you do not need uh, very advanced C programming skills, okay? You don't need that. As long as you have the basic understanding, all right, and you can remember all the, the, the basic stuff you did, I think that is good enough, all right? So the C programming actually is more needed in the second part where we are going to deal with operating systems, all right? Uh, so even though we are learning operating systems concepts, okay, it will be based on a C programming environment. Okay, so I think it will come in more handy in the second half. In the first half, we are going to just have very simple programs because we are more interested in understanding how a program translates into actual uh, machine, land, uh, machine uh, level language, all right, uh, through the instruction set architecture. All right, so the first half is, is much more basic programming in terms of C, but the second half, uh, a bit more is required. Okay, so good. I think uh, we are in good position, okay, if I'm looking at the results. Okay, those who say cannot make it, I think no need to worry. All right, like I said, you just need very basic uh, C programming for this module. All right, so as long as the basic stuff is there, I think you are, you are fine. Okay, so let me uh, move ahead. All right, so we will just have a very, very quick, okay, recap on uh, uh, C programming and its basic, okay, just to make sure that everybody sort of understands the, 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 the fundamentals that you have uh, learned. Again, this is just some uh, uh, history of C. Okay, like I said, it has been taught for ages, okay, and it's still the most popular language for many, many, uh, low level applications uh, uh, even up to now. All right, so it's still a very, very uh, highly uh, in demand language, I would say. All right, so in terms of uh, editing, compile, executing, all right, so these slides, uh, again, most of the time you see some Linux commands and so on, but uh, it's fine, okay? So this is just to give you an idea of uh, compiling it, but uh, you can use any application that you want to test your code. Right, so uh, editing and compiling, again, all this basic stuff we know. All right, generally, after we compile, we get, we, uh, get what we know as executable code. And we can run it. So when you run it, of course, we see the output. And from the output, we can know whether uh, it is right or wrong. And of course, if you cannot get the executable code, that means you cannot compile, that means there is some error. So you need to go back and edit your source code. All right. So finally, once you get the uh, source code uh, being able to compile, then you can execute the code and finally see the outcome for yourself, all right, to see whether it's correct. All right. So those basic stuff uh, you should know. So for any C program, you have a preprocessor directives. Okay, you always start with the main function. 
Okay, and then you have your declaration of variables and then all the statements that you want. That means the actual functionality you want to uh, perform. So when you talk about uh, functionality, it usually consists of three parts, correct? There's always some input data, there is some computation you want to carry on, and finally you want to get the output results. Right, so this is just to show you a very simple uh, example where you have uh, uh, a C program. So all the details, okay, I will show you over here. So as you can see, uh, in the first part, that you have preprocessor directives. Okay, so in this preprocessor directives, what do you do? Two things. One is you include any necessary header files. All right. So in the C program, if you want to do specific uh, functionality you want to do string functions you want to deal with high level uh, mathematics okay so they have uh, specific header files for that so you need to include those header files all right at the top which are preprocessor directives and then you have constants that you can define all right so again the whole idea of constants is that uh, with constants you can um, uh, you can make it easy to make changes later on all right so you just use the constant name in your code all right, and then subsequently, if you think you need to update it, you just need to update it in one place. All right, so those are the preprocessor directives. Uh, of course, there are other processor preprocessor directives like macros as well. Okay, so if you have used it, then you know. If not, it's fine. Okay, and then you have uh, reserve keywords. Okay, so any programming language always has reserve keywords. That means those are keywords used uh, by the compiler for specific. Uh, interpretation so you cannot use those keywords as variable names or, or anything like that or function names or anything like that okay so things like integer uh, character float these are for variable declaration okay uh, main is of course main then you have void and so on so these are all uh, reserved keywords which you should not use generally most uh, development environments whether you use uh, microsoft visual studio or dev c plus plus or anything like that uh, these reserve keywords generally show up in a different color. Okay, so it's sort of uh, it's indicative the moment you, you type it out. All right, so it's easy for you to spot. Okay, then you have variable names. Okay, so variable names, of course, uh, there are many different formats that you follow. All right, uh, generally, when you talk about constants, okay, you can see here we use capital letters. Again, this is just a convention. Uh, for variables, you start. Uh, use uh, lowercase. Uh, some of them, uh, some ways you call it, uh, sometimes you call it camel case as well. Camel case is where, where you want to put multiple words together. All right. Uh, and then you want to combine them together. So, for example, um, uh, for example, miles, or you, if you want to take, for example, uh, jar length. Okay. So, for example, jar length. Okay, so you start off with lower and then the next word you start off with the uppercase and so on. So this is what we call the camel case uh, convention. Uh, of course, you don't need to always follow it. You can maybe put a underscore to separate words together. All right, so again, these are just uh, naming conventions that you come across in, in reference text. Okay, uh, you can generally choose something that you are more comfortable with. Okay, comments. Uh, in any programming language, you have your own way of putting comments. Uh, most languages support uh, double slash or slash star. Some put uh, the percentage sign for comments. All right, so it all depends on the programming language. All right, so C generally supports double code, uh, double slash and uh, slash star and star slash. Okay, for comments. Again, comments are very very important. All right, uh, you will forget why you wrote that code. Uh, even probably the next day or so. All right, so by putting comments, uh, you, you sort of remind yourself why you did certain things. All right, so it's always good to have comments. Then, the, uh, then you have the actual functions that you're writing. Okay? And then finally, the uh, symbols that are reserved, uh, semicolon, uh, colon, and so on. Okay, uh, so in terms of uh, most C functions, they end with a uh, semicolon all right so that is the default for almost all uh, c functions that you write okay or c statements that you write 
Okay, so now let's have an idea of what really happens okay, in the computer memory. Now, if you look at this over here, you are going to execute this code miles to kilometer. Correct. So when you come back to this, uh, let me come back here. So when I first uh, run this code, okay, when I compile and I download this code and I start executing, this, uh, the compiler, all right, when it sees that you have asked for two variables, miles and kilometers, okay, it will set aside two memory locations, okay, called miles and called kilometers, okay, inside the memory space. Okay, similarly, uh, your code, the actual code is also running off the memory space of the system. All right. Now, if you look back at the code, both these variables are uninitialized. All right. You did not equate them to any value. So since you did not equate them to any value, okay, you cannot assume that they contain zero. All right. So it could be, it could be zero. Okay, or it could be some garbage value. All right, so you do not know. So that's why you put a question mark there. All right, now the very first time you run, all right, then you prompt the user and then you use scan app to capture. So when you say scan app to capture, what happens? You are capturing the user input and you're updating the variable. All right, so of course, in terms of the uh, programming uh, logic, you say it now is stored inside miles. Okay, so now. Whenever we use scanf, we use the ampersand sign in front of the miles, all right? Can anybody tell me why you need to put the ampersand sign in front? What does the ampersand signify? Does anybody remember from your C++? Yeah, it is the address of the memory. All right, so the ampersand sign tells us the address. So coming back here, all right? So all your variables or your code everywhere, is stored at some address location, all right? So for example, miles could be stored in address location, uh, maybe, okay, 0xA000, maybe this is 0xA008 or something like that. Okay, so there is a address associated with every variable. So the address is the physical location where it is stored. Okay, in the software, we don't worry about the address because we always relate to it based on the name miles okay but in terms of the back end we relate miles to an address a location all right so when i say scan f percentage f n percent miles i'm telling the computer that i want to take this variable or this information that i capture and put it into the address that is associated with miles all right so if this is the address a000 i want to put the value into this address location so that is what is happening. Similarly, when I perform some computation and I update a variable, okay, I'm also assigning it a value now. So KMS is a variable name, is also associated with a address, correct? So in this case, it's A008. Okay, so I'm now telling the uh, program that I want to take this new value and put it into this variable location called KMS, okay, kilometers, all right, and I, and I want to put this new value that I just calculated. All right, so this architecture, all right, uh, that we just saw is basically what we call the von Neumann architecture. All right, so in this von Neumann architecture, uh, what you have is you have a CPU, which is in charge of uh, executing your instructions. Then you have your memory, okay, so your CPU, you have your memory. So the memory is a place where you store both program and data. So if you look back at this picture, you can see that this memory region here has both. So this is your code or the program, and this is your data. Okay, so both code and data occupy a single unified memory. Okay, so that is what is shown here, a single unified memory for both your program and your data. And then you also have your IO devices, so input and output. So this is the von Neumann architecture. 
All right. So this is again, uh, there are two main different type of architecture. One is called the Harvard architecture. The other is the von Neumann architecture. So we are going to be focusing more on the von Neumann architecture, okay, to understand how uh, it works. All right. So in terms of uh, variables, I think we just, uh, I will not go through all the details of all this. Okay. So I think most of it, you already know because you have studied C++, but I will just again quickly go through just to recap. All right, so the variable declaration, we already know we need to put a variable or data type over here. So either float, integer, character, double. So these are all the usual ones that you will use. All right, and then you can put a variable name. Okay, if you want to initialize it, you just make sure that you assign it to a value at the same time. So that is what you call a definition. So either you declare a variable or you define a variable. All right, so these are the, again, usual uh, data types that we have associated in C. Okay, now the um, data types also are associated with the size. All right, so the size that a variable occupies uh, is dependent on a few different uh, features, uh, a few different parameters. It could be the actual system you're running on, the development environment you're using and so on. So the only thing okay, that I can say that is really consistent across all platforms is a character. The size of character alone, you'll always get it as one byte. All right, but everything else, integer, float, double. Okay, so even though we see as four, four, eight over here, okay, it may actually be different in a different system. Okay, because it may depend on the actual compiler that you use, the hardware that uh, or the processor or system that you're using. All right, so it may change. All right, so in some cases, float may be eight, double may be 16 or something like that. All right, so it's always uh, depending on, on the actual uh, hardware that you use or the compiler that you use and so on. The only consistent thing you can say is character is one byte. All right, so again, this, size of why does why does this matter because when you know the number of bytes set aside for a particular variable then you have a better idea of what is the range of numbers you can hold all right so this we will get to it in more detail when we discuss it in the next chapter on the uh, number representation Okay, so our program structure, again, I think we just went through this, the preprocessor directives, input, uh, compute, and output. Okay, so yeah, I will not go through this too much, but like what I said, the key advantage of this uh, preprocessor directives is that you can actually uh, specify it upfront and but what the compiler will see is it will actually replace this variable or this uh, preprocessor name with the actual value, okay, uh, before it actually compiles the code. All right, so the key advantage is uh, you can always change it in just one location and it gets updated everywhere else. Right, so I think that is the key advantage of this. Okay, so printf and scanf, uh, I think I don't need to go through too much, okay? So printf, you know, whenever you do scanf, you need to uh, make sure you put the correct uh, format specifier here, okay? And then the variable that you want, all right? So again, these are things that you should know, okay? From your C++ uh, exposure. Okay, these are all the escape sequences, all right? The slash n, slash t, and so on. Uh, again, these are just to make the output, okay? Presentable to, to, to match what you want. Okay, the computation part, again, is all depends on whatever you want to do. Okay, so when we execute this uh, line, for example, okay, what are we doing? We are taking two different variables. Okay, we are performing a multiplication sign and we are taking the result and putting it into a new variable here or KMS. All right, so that is basically what we are doing. All right, so of course the important thing is that the original data is not changed, all right? The uh, kilometers per mile and miles, all this original data still is, is there, all right? But the, the output value is now updated. So previously we do not know what it was, 
But after I perform this computation, it now has a new updated value. Okay, okay, so the this part here is on typecasting. Okay, so typecasting is again something that is uh, quite, uh, I would say it's a very interesting thing that uh, C supports. Okay, uh, so even though it's good, it can also lead to some, uh, maybe some confusion and some uh, issues if you don't manage it well. Okay, so for example, over here, uh, float, you have two variables, integer a a 6 and float ff equals to 15.8. Okay, now float pp equals to float a a uh, divided by 4. So what are we doing here? So when I say float a a divided by 4, this float is applying to the variable a a. Okay, so when the float applies to variable a a, what am I doing? I am telling the uh, the processor that for this particular instruction, I am temporarily treating a a okay as a float variable. Okay, so since I am temporarily treating it as a float variable, this computation will not be carried out as a float. So that is why the un the six divided by four, I am able to get a answer with a decimal point 1.5 all right now if i look at the next instruction here integer ff divided by aa what is happening i'm taking ff which is a float but i'm now casting it to an integer that means for this particular instruction i want to treat it as an integer all right so when i treat it as an integer all right what happens is it becomes 15 Point eight, which is 15 divided by 6. Okay, so it will be 2 point something. All right, so since it's 2 point something and I'm the result is stored in the integer variable, I'm only able to keep the integer portion of it. Okay, and this last part, AA divided by 4. Okay, and then cast the float. Now this one, AA divided by 4. So what's the difference between this and this? How come in the first line you get 1.5, but here you get only 1.0? All right. So the key difference is when the computation was performed, when the division was performed, what was the nature or the type of both the variables? Now, if you look at this division, I'm putting a bracket here. All right. That means this is performed first. So a a divided by four a is integer four is integer. So this division will be treated as an integer division. So I'm taking an integer divided by integer. So the answer is still an integer. So six divided by four is one point five. But since it's an integer division, the answer is one. All right. But the result, this answer one, I am then casting it to a float. So this float only comes into effect after the division is performed. So that is why the one becomes 1.0. Okay, whereas in this case, the float is applied to AA first before the division. So the division is considered to be a float division. So that is why the answer is able to retain the decimal point. Okay, so that's why I said that this casting is a uh, very useful feature, but if you do not use it correctly or you, you know, misinterpret it, then your answers may be, uh, you know, a bit wrong. All right. So um, next comes to if else statements. Again, I think all of this uh, are some things you are familiar with. All right. So I will not go through all the details. So you have if, you have if else, you have if else, if else, if, and so on. All right. So these are again uh, useful to to decide when to execute and when to skip certain portions of the code. Again, an alternative to if else is your switch case. So again, both work equally well. In some cases, switch case will be a bit more elegant. Uh, in some cases, if else is a bit better. All right, so again, all depends on uh, what you're trying to do. All right, and uh, with if else and all, definitely you have a lot of uh, conditions to check. So the key thing is conditions are always being checked for whether they are true or false. All right, so the outcome of any condition is a Boolean result. Okay, it's either true or false. All right, so in uh, C, 
Okay. Uh, in logic, generally, we say that only zero represents false, and anything that is not zero is true. So any number that is not zero is considered true. Okay. So if you look at this, okay, if two greater than three, okay, so two is not greater than three. Okay. So it's false. So a becomes zero. Three is greater than two, so the answer is one is true. Okay, so there is no particular Boolean type in NCC, all right? But you can always evaluate expressions, and the result is always going to be one or zero. Okay, and of course you can cascade different or logical checking together using the operators and or not. All right, so there are two types. Huh? So you can have Whenever you want to do logical uh, uh, cascading of uh, combination of expressions, you use and or not. Okay, so if I say a, uh, sorry for that, um, a and and b means all right. You are trying to see whether a and b. So in terms of uh, logic. Okay, so if you remember your end gate 0, 0, 0, 0001 1, 0, 1, 1. So only when both are true, the output is true. Everything else is false. All right, so it's your basic, your sort of Boolean logic. Okay, end gate, or gate, and not gate. Then there's also another variation to this, which is the single end and the single or. Okay, so if I say A and B. A or B. All right. Can anybody tell me what, what you are doing here? A and B, A or B. What is this? What kind of operation do we call this compared to a double N or a double O? Okay. So again, I'm not sure if you've done this before in C. Okay, this double N or double O is basically what we call the logical operations. This single N and single O is what we call the bitwise operations. Okay, so when I say A and B, A or B, what I'm doing is I'm taking the A and B, I'm looking at it as a binary stream and I'm performing a bit by bit operation. All right, so we will look at this. Uh, later on, okay, once we come to the MIPS part of it. All right, so this is basically what we call the bitwise operations of two variables. Okay, and this is also very important uh, to figure out whether certain bits are set or certain bits are clear inside a variable. All right, then you also have your repetition uh, structures, all right, your loops, okay, which is a while, do while, and for loop. Okay, so I will again not go through all of this. I think you have sufficient uh, exposure with all of this. All right, uh, again, these are just an example to show you how you can perform the same thing. Okay, summing through one to 10 with uh, three different approaches. Okay, for loop, while loop, and uh, do while loop. Okay, so again, uh, I hope the pace was okay. Like I said, this first three slides, again, is just to give you a background and to give you or make, uh, bring you up to speed of where we are starting from all right and since all of you have done c or c plus plus i think that quick recap is basically like i say is enough for you to get through at least the first part without any issue all right and the second part as well is not too much of c it's just a bit more of what we are doing now okay so we will go for a break now all right now it's uh, 7 30. Okay, we'll go for about uh, a 10 minutes break, okay? Uh, 7.40 or 7.45, okay, let's take 15 minutes. We'll come back, all right? And uh, we will start on the chapter on number systems, all right? Uh, again, number systems, uh, you may have exposed, been exposed to it before, but we will still go through step by step to make sure you understand. Uh, and then that was important because from there, we will go on to understanding MIPS architecture. Okay, which is very closely related to how numbers are represented at the binary level. Okay, so let's uh, go for a few minutes break now. Now it's 7.30. Okay, 7.45, I will see you all back here and then we can uh, start on the lecture three. 
all right on number systems okay so if you have any questions you want to ask you can just put it in the chat first okay later when we come back from the break i will address those questions okay so can you all uh, see my screen okay thank you okay uh, so just to update you all uh, yeah so as i mentioned all the recordings will be uh, uploaded uh, and shared all right so you can always view it so usually uh, usually one to two days later it should be available all right and i will share the links with you all all right and at the same time uh, i'm also required to share the uh, class uh, those uh, participant list to with the scale all right so those of uh, the students who log in and everything uh, for the class i will share it with scale uh, i think this uh, is more for students who are currently under some form of a uh, scholarship or funding you know where you need to have some new attendance requirements all right so for those of you who uh, fit into those please make sure you uh, come in so that you can uh, hit those attendance requirements all right so i uh, just just to to let you all know that all right um so let's get started with this uh, lecture so this lecture onwards again uh, i will treat it as a new material for all of you all right, the earlier parts that we discussed on the C and everything and just introduction and some recap. So we went at a bit faster rate. All right, uh, from now on, we will go at a, a more, uh, I would say, comfortable pace, okay, to make sure that you understand. All right, so all this I will treat it as new material, all right, that uh, you all are seeing for the first time. All right, so in this first lecture here, uh, this lecture three, we are going to be looking at data representation and number systems, all right, to understand how uh data or numbers are generally represented inside a computing system and uh how we can actually interpret it differently okay looking at the same set of uh, ones and zeros all right so again this is the uh things we'll cover all right but we will come to that along the way now let's look at the basic data types in C. Okay, so we, we know that we have uh, integer, we have float, double, and character. Of course, these are the four basic data types in C that we use most regularly. Now, how is it actually represented okay, based on its type? Okay, so you have uh, an 8-bit value, you can have a multi-bit value, and so on. All right, now, if I look at this 8-bit value over here, uh, I can treat it as uh, integer and I can interpret it as 70. Okay, if I treat it as a character, I will say this is character F. If I look at this 32 bit string over here and I look at it as an integer, I get this number negative 1060 and so on. At the same time, I can also treat it as a float and I will interpret it as negative 6.5. Now, at first glance, of course, this may seem a bit confusing, all right, if you have not seen this before. All right, so what we are trying to show you is I'm looking at the same uh, ones and zeros, all right, but yet I'm interpreting it differently depending on how I classify it. Okay, so if I look at this set of bits over here and I say that this is representing an integer, then I decode it in that same thought process as an integer and I get a value of 70. But this same ones and zeros, I give it to you and I say this is actually a character. Then you will interpret it differently and then it represents some particular character value. All right. So the ones and zeros are just ones and zeros. How we interpret them is related to our understanding of the data. All right. So that is very important. All right, so ultimately, okay, we know that everything comes down to ones and zeros in a computing system. So we call it the bits, okay, or binary digits. Okay, in terms of standard units, otherwise you call it bytes, which is eight bits. Okay, and nibble is four bits, which is rarely used. Okay, next comes word. 
Now, again, word is not a clearly defined term. Okay? Again, it depends on the architecture of the underlying processor we're dealing with. Okay? A word is basically a group of bytes, but whether is it a group of four bytes, eight bytes, 16 bytes, okay, it all depends on the architecture we are dealing with. All right, so there's no clear definition to say how big a word is. All right, so it, it depends. Now, we know that since each bit represents two values, n bits can represent two to the power of n values. Okay, so if I have two bits, I can have four different values. Okay, so 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Similarly, if I have four bits, I have to the power of 16 and so on. All right, so it all uh, relates to this two to the power of n, and uh, depending on number of bits we have. Now, to represent m values, you need lock the base to m bits. All right, so for example, if I have 32 values, okay, in my system, and I want to represent them in, in a binary uh, or digital format, how many bits do I need? So I need to have lock the base to 32, which will give me uh, five bits, okay, and so on. If I have 1,000 values, I will require 10 bits and so on. Now, how do we translate uh, binary or any other number system to its actual value? So this brings us back okay, to our base 10 number system that we have actually been learning from the time we were in uh, kindergarten or something like that. All right. So what is our base 10 number system? Our base 10 number system is basically what we call a weighted positional number system where the base is 10. All right. So when I have a number, okay, so for example, if I give you this number, all right, so uh, let's give you a minute. Huh? Let me open up something else. Okay, so if I give you uh, any number, okay, so for example, okay, so now we're going to be looking at the base 10 number system. So let's say if I give you this number 159, all right? Now, when I look at this, I can immediately say that this is 159. All right, so of course, in our primary school or kindergarten, we learn it based on the position of the bits, correct? So what are we taught when we were in primary school? Okay, we are told that this is the ones bit. This is the tens bit. This is the hundreds bit, and so on. Correct? So this is what we have been taught. So ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, and so on, correct? Now, this ones, tens, a hundred is actually what? Is actually a weighted position. Okay, why is it a weighted position? Because now this same 159, if I put a base 10 to it, okay, I say this is base 10. Why, why do we call it a base 10? Because we are brought up to understand the number systems that span 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So there are a total of 10 different values here. So that's why we call it a base 10 number system. Now, with this base 10 number system, and I use a weighted position. So the very first position is position 0. So it becomes 9 multiplied by 10 to the power of 0. And this equals to 9. All right? This one. So the weight, when we say it's a weighted position, we start off with weight 0, and then it increments by 1 with each bit. So now it is a weight 1 multiply by 5, which will be 50. And finally, here it will be power 2 multiplied by 1, which is 100. 
So I take these three values, 100 plus 50 plus 9. What do I get? 159. Okay, so this thing that we learned in primary school, ones, tens, hundreds, and so on, is actually the weighted position system of this base 10 way of representing numbers. All right, so this is what we grew up with. All right, but it's actually basically what you call the base 10 number system. All right, so this is the same thing, okay, that uh, the reason why we are able to interpret the numbers the way we see them. All right, so when, whenever we see any number, we can immediately say uh, what it represents because we have brought up uh, or we have been brought up to immediately uh, interpret all of them in the base 10 format. All right, so when I look at this number over here, I can immediately say that this is 7,594.36, all right? Um, because we know the weighted position of each of the digits over there, all right? But if you were to work it out step by step, this is what you will get. So you have 10 to the power of zero times four, 10 to the power of one times nine, 10 to the power of two times five, 10 to the power of three times seven and so on. Correct. Right. And the same thing applies for decimal values. When you go uh, to the right of the decimal place, it becomes 10 to the power of minus one, 10 to the power of minus two, minus three, and so on. Okay, so that is basically how you interpret any number with a particular base. All right. Now, this same concept is basically what you need to extend for any base. Okay, so if you have a binary system, which is base two, you do the same thing. If you have a octal system, base eight, hexadecimal, base 16, whatever, you do the exact same thing. You take the base with a weighted position. So the weighted position basically means that you always start off with weight zero, weight one, weight two, weight three, and so on. When you go to the right of the decimal place, you go minus one, minus two, minus three, and so on. So it is the only thing that is changing is the base. So if it's a base 10, the base is 10, all right? Everything else, the process is the same, okay? So that is basically the way in which you can easily interpret and convert numbers from one form to another form. Okay, in terms of representing different uh, types of numbers, all right? Uh, generally for decimal, okay, we don't put anything, all right? So if I say uh, 34, if I don't put any uh, prefix or I don't put any subscript or anything, you just take it as value 34. Okay, but if I say this is going to be a hexadecimal, all right, so to represent it as hexadecimal, usually there's two ways. Either I must put it as 0x or I put a base 16 below it then this becomes a hexadecimal number. All right, so sometimes you need to uh, be clear on what is the uh, format of this, uh, that is representing this number. Is it a base 10 number? Is it a base two, uh, base 16, and so on. All right, so let's look at how we can apply this base R uh, sort of approach to solving this conversion. Now, what you have here is this binary bit string over here. Okay, 1101.101. 1101. Okay, so there's a question here. Where is hexadecimal used? Okay, so hexadecimal is used uh, when you have... Uh, a hexadecimal is basically a easier way to represent... Uh, binary bit strings when you have too many of them. Okay, as you can see, when you have so many ones and zeros, it gets confusing, correct? But if I'm able to represent the binary in hexadecimal, it's a lot easier to interpret, all right? So we will, we will see that in a while, okay? When we are converting uh, binary to hexadecimal, okay? Uh, you, you just think of it as a shortcut way. So instead of, for example, like for example, how we use uh, kilograms, Okay, to represent uh, big heavy weights. 
Correct. So instead of saying 1,232 grams, we say we say 1.23 kilograms. Right. So the hexadecimal is like an easier way to represent uh, very big binary strings. Okay. Now let's uh, look at this uh, binary conversion. So what we have here is a binary number 1101 to 101. Okay. So as I mentioned, we look at the base. So if this base is two, okay, then we are going to use base two in the calculation. So we always start with the weight zero for the first digit. So this is two to the power of zero. This is two to the power of one, two to the power of two, and two to the power of three. Okay, I don't know why the line keeps appearing on my screen. All right, so, so this to the power of uh, zero, what you need to do is multiply by one. So that is what you have here. Two to the power of one multiplied by zero. Okay, so in this case, basically anything multiplied by zero is zero. So that's why we did not write it here. But basically you have another two to the power of one multiplied by zero. But this is not written here. Okay, because zero multiplied by zero is always zero. Then two to the power of two multiplied by one followed by two to the power of three multiplied by one. Okay, so as you can see, this represents the, the whole number part. All right, then to the right of the decimal place, you do the same thing. Only thing is, you start with two to the power of minus one, two to the power of minus two, two to the power of minus three. Okay, so two to the power of minus one times one, is here. Then you have uh, 2 to the power of minus 2 times 0. Again, this is not shown here. Followed by 2 to the power of minus 3 times 1. Okay, so this is the fractional part. Alright, so if you kind of interpret it together, okay, so these are the numbers you will get. So you get, okay, uh, so 8 plus 4 plus 1 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.125. And then the final answer is 13.625. All right, so this answer 13.625 here. Okay, you see there is a base 10. Okay, so this base 10 tells you that this is the actual decimal value. The actual decimal value that is uh, equivalent to this binary representation. Okay, so this and this are the same. Okay, one one zero one. Okay, so one one zero one dot one zero one. Okay, so this two are the same. Okay, only thing is one is represented in binary notation, the other is represented in decimal notation, but the value is the same. Okay, it's just different forms of representing the same information. All right, so you can apply the same thinking to any base. So if now if I have base eight, I do the same thing. Okay, so as you can see, to the left of the decimal place, I do the weighted power zero, power one, power two, and to the right of the decimal place is the minus one, minus two, and so on. Okay, and then you get the answer. If it's base 16, again, the same thing. Okay, so for base 16, uh, you have uh, 16 different digits. Okay, so maybe let me go back here. Okay. So, when you, uh, let's go back to this slide over here. Okay, so in this slide, you can see that the hexadecimal digits, okay, you have 16 possible values. So, what are 16 possible values? You have 0 to 9, okay, so which is the first 10, and then uh, after 9 is what? This is 10. This is 11, this is 12, this is 13, this is 14, and this is 15. So, so the total range is from 0 to 15. Okay, but only 0 to 9, we can represent it as numbers. Then 10 to 15 is represented using the alphabets A to F. So that is how you represent the hexadecimal digits. All right, so it's from 0 all the way to F. Okay, so coming back here.
Yeah, so coming back here, you can see that the A is actually equivalent to 10. Okay, that is why the 10 is over here. So just remember it's 0 to 9. Then after that is A, B, C, D, E, F. So A is 10, B is 11, and so on. All right, so that is how you can easily remember the hexadecimal representation. All right, but the approach is the same. Okay, you always start with weighted position index 0, 1 to the left. And then minus one to the right. All right. So whatever is the base, you do uh, take it the same approach. Okay. How do you do decimal to binary conversion? Okay. So I'm just uh, so this is just to show you how it is done. Okay. But you can easily do it using a calculator. All right. So basically, what you need to do is you need to do a continuous division by two. Okay. So let me show you step by step over here. So for example, this number 43, I divide by 2. So when I divide by 2, what happens? I will get 21, okay? But I have a remainder of 1, all right? So that remainder is basically the ones that will be used to form the bits. So I will do continuously until I get 0. So again, divide by 2. So I'll get 10 remainder 1. I divide by 2 again. So in this case, I can divide by 2, so there is no remainder. Okay, so again, I divide by 2, 2, remainder 1. Again, I divide by 2, I get 1, remainder 0, and I get finally divide by 2, I get 0, remainder 1. Okay, and this is basically the full binary string. The last one is your most significant bit. And this is your least significant bit. So what is MSB and what is LSB? So whenever you write a sequence of binary bits, the most significant bit is basically what we call the bit on the left most. Okay, and the least significant bit is the right most. Okay, so to write this out, it will be one, zero, 1, 0, 1, 1, okay? And you can put it as a base 2 over here to say that this is a binary number. Okay, so of course, we are just showing you how to do it. Okay, the easiest way is, of course, to use your calculator. Okay, so let me just show you uh, how you can use a calculator. Uh, almost all of you would have a built-in calculator in your system, whether it's Mac or Windows or anything. So if you have a Windows, all right, if you open up a calculator, okay, you have, by default, you will open up in this uh, standard mode. Okay, so what you can do is you can, on the top left corner, you can go to what we call the programmer mode. Okay, uh, if you have your, uh, an app on your phone, also I think uh, most calculators also have this kind of a mode. So in this case, you can just key in the number. So in this case, decimal, you select the correct uh, format you want. So if I want decimal, I click decimal, I key in 43, and you can see that automatically it comes out here. So of course you see that it has another two zeros in front of it, okay? And the reason is because it always gives you answers in multiples of uh, four bits, okay? So that is why you see the additional two zeros in front. Okay, but additional zeros in front have no impact on the value. Okay, so we just need to worry about the first one that you see. So the answer is the same. Okay, so you can always use your calculator to get the value. Okay, the only uh, drawback is most calculators only deal with this conversion with whole numbers. Okay, if you have fractional um, decimal points, okay, you still need to do it manually. Okay, uh, there may be some calculators they still do it. Okay, but the default ones that you get uh, most likely will not handle it. Okay, so again, this is one example. Okay, on the fractional part. So how do I deal with fractional uh, conversion? So basically, uh, you do continuous multiplication. Okay, so let me show you step by step. So 0 0.3125, okay, I want to convert this uh, fractional part to the equivalent binary representation. So what I need to do is, I do repeated multiplication by two. Okay, for the whole number part, 
Okay, come back here. The whole number part is continuous division by two. Okay, for the uh, fractional part is continuous multiplication by two. Okay, so what I need to do here is I multiply by two. Okay, I'll get 0 0.625. So I get a zero here. Okay, so what you need to do is focus on the bit just uh, in front of the decimal point. Okay, so you keep on doing a multiplication by two. And when the result is bigger than one, so in this case, for example, the result is bigger than one. In the next step, what I do, I, I discard that one. So I remove the one and go back to putting it at zero. Okay, so 0 0.5 multiplied by 2, I'll get 1.0. So the moment you get 1.0, you stop. Okay, the moment you get 1, you stop. And then the answer is all the ones, all the bits that are in front of the decimal point here. Okay, so in this case, it is the first bit that you get is the most significant bit. And this is the least significant bit. So the answer here would be, uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, base 2. Okay? So that's the answer here. Okay? So this is the way in which you convert the fractional part, okay, of the binary to the equivalent uh, binary, uh, so fractional part of the decimal to the equivalent binary. Okay, so conversion uh, between different uh, bases and all can uh, easily be done by converting them to decimal and then from decimal to anywhere else. Okay, so for example, you want to convert base 16 uh, to base 8 or some other base or some other funny base, you can always take the decimal as an intermediary step. So I convert it to decimal first and then from decimal I can convert to any other base later on. Okay, so that is if you need to do it. Okay, but at the same time, there are shortcuts available for some of this conversion. All right, so for example, octal. Octal is about, is using three bits, okay, to do the representation. So if I'm using three bits, all I need to do is to group the bits in, in, in trees. Okay, so if I look at this, from a decimal point, I have three bits here, three bits here, three bits here, and Two bits. So when I am only left with two bits, okay, and nothing else, then I can just insert a zero in front of it. Like I said, a zero in front makes no difference. Okay, but I can now convert. Similarly to the right, three bits, three bits. Okay, now this, now what you do is, each three bit value is now going to represent the equivalent decimal value. Okay, so how do I do it? Okay. Oh, sorry, the equivalent octal value. Okay, we're converting the octal. So, 0, 0, 001 is 1. 0, 1, 1 is 3. Okay, 111 1, 1 is 7, and 0, 1, 0 is 2. Okay, if you are still not sure how to convert, okay, so for example, this 0, 1, 1, how do I know that it is 3? Okay, because this is binary, all right. So binary, the equivalent value is what? Okay, so if I look at it, this is base two. Okay, so if I want to do step by step, okay, it will be two to the power of zero multiplied by one, which is for the first digit here, plus two to the power of one multiplied by one. Correct? This first, this last one is zero, so I can no. So it will become two to the power of zero is one. And this is two. So the answer is three. Okay, so that is how you can convert each of it to the actual value. All right. Uh, of course, the easier way, if you still, uh, if you want, you can just use the calculator to convert. All right. So if you bring out your calculator, okay, if you, if you think you just want to use your calculator to convert, you just switch to binary. And you can just, for example, key in, for example, 0, 1, 1. It'll give you three. Okay, uh, one zero one give you five. Okay, so you can just key in any binary number and it will give you the equivalent 
uh, decimal value immediately. Okay, so that is also another easy way to just do the conversion. Okay, octal to binary is the reverse. All right, uh, where each octal digit is converted to its equivalent three bit value. So each of it you convert to three bit value 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and so on. Okay, so octal again is not something that is so um, heavily used. All right, what is more important, I would say, is this two binary and hexadecimal because these are the two most. Uh, heavily used uh, conversion that you will see again and again. All right. So this you need to really make sure you understand, and it's very easy. All right. Because for hexadecimal, you treat it as groups of four. Okay. Why groups of four? Okay. Let's come back to this earlier slide here. Because hexadecimal, if you look at it, has a base 16. That means I have a total 16 different possible combinations. All right. So if I have a total of 16 different possible combinations, how many bits do I need? How many bits do I need? Come back to here. Log to the base 2M. So if I do a log the base to 16, what do I get? So I get four. All right, so I need four bits to represent 16 different values. Okay, so that is why when I say that I represent my number in hexadecimal format, I need four bits to represent each digit. Why? Because each digit has 16 different possible values. So I need four bits to represent those 16 different values. All right, so with that understanding, we can say that it's very easy to directly translate, okay, between uh, binary and hexadecimal. Okay, so all I need to do is take the binary, okay, from the decimal point, group, into groups of four. Again, the last one, if you don't have group of four, you just add a zero in front. Okay, similarly, you do to the right. And then what do you do? Each group of four, you translate to its actual uh, value. Okay, so one zero zero one is nine. Okay, one one zero one is uh, D. Okay, zero one zero one is five. Okay, so one zero one one is uh, B, and this is one zero 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 is eight. Okay, so you can straight away translate and put it as a base sixteen. Okay, and when you want to do it in the reverse, you do the same thing. You take each hexadecimal value, and you represent it by its four bit binary equivalent. So nine is one zero zero one. D is 1101 and so on. Okay, so after a while you will get used to it and you will immediately know how to translate. All right, but again, if you still find it a bit troublesome, you can just open up a calculator and you can just key it in and you can get the answer. All right, so again, this is also right, uh, readily available in your calculator. So if you go back to your calculator over here, you can also directly. Uh, convert okay so for example if i put five uh the okay some number here okay oh, no, man. let me put it in the hexadecimal so the hexadecimal if i put in a1 so it translates to decimal value 161 okay so if, if you're not sure how 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 does this work why is a1 161 Okay, so why is A1161? Again, let's come back here. So, what is A1? A1 in hexadecimal, if I want to convert it to my um, actual decimal value, what do I need to do? I do the base 16. 
Okay, just remember, it's always the weighted position. 16 power 0 multiplied by 1. That is for the first digit. Plus 16 power 1 multiplied by A. What is A? A is 10. All right. So what is the answer I get here? 10 times 16 is 160. Okay. 16 power 0 is 1. 1 times 1 is 1. So this answer is 1, 6, 1. All right. Now the next thing, how do I translate this to binary now? Okay. I take each hexadecimal digit. Remember, each hexadecimal digit is represented by its four-bit binary equivalent. So one is zero 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 one, and A is one zero one zero. So the combined value will be okay one zero one zero 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 one. This is in base two. Okay, if I take out my calculator and I key it in. 1010001, you'll get the answer here, 161 or A1. If you want to do the weighted positioning with the binary, also can. Okay, that means what? The weighted position means this is 2 to the power of 0 multiplied by 1. Okay, so let's let me write the weights on top. This is weight 0, this is weight 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7. So all the zeros I'm going to ignore because multiply by 0 is still 0. So this will be 2 to the power of 5 times 1. And this will be 2 to the power of 7 times 1. All right. Now let's just key it in our calculator. Okay, so you can see 2 to the power 7 is 1 to 8. Okay, so this is 1 to 8. 2 to the power of 5 is uh, 32. 2 to the power 0 is 1. 1 to 1 is 1. Okay, and then if I put everything together, 1 to 8 plus 32 plus 1, I get 161. Okay, so you can see that, okay, you can represent the same number, okay, in hexadecimal form, in decimal form, in binary form. But they are all the same. They are all the same. You're just representing them in different ways, okay, decimal, hexadecimal, and binary. Okay, so uh, don't worry huh, if you think it's like quite a lot of different things. If you once you try a few times, okay, uh, I'll be uploading the tutorial uh, later, okay, by this week, so you can have a look. But uh, we will probably do it a bit later only, all right. But uh, with some practice, all right, you will see that it's, it's, it's quite okay, okay, quite manageable. All Okay, so I just want to show you that. All right, so you can see that it's quite easy to relate and translate. Okay, once you get the idea of what is binary, what is hexadecimal, okay, that every by uh, every hexadecimal bit is four bit binary, and you can just easily translate between one and the other. Okay, uh, so another let me just see. Yeah, you can choose whatever method. Okay, so you, whether the shortcut method or long method is fine. Huh? We will not restrict you to use a particular method for this conversion. Okay, and uh, anyway, uh, yeah, all the tests, uh, I mean, the exams are all, uh, you have your calculators as well. So all the calculators also you can use to do the conversion. So no issues. All right. Uh, Okay, so I will just cover this ST code. Let me see. Yeah. Okay, we will cover ST code and then we will call it a day for today. 
All right, since it's the first lesson, and then next week when we come back, we will go on to the negative numbers part. Okay, so uh, this X key code, what is X key code? It's basically a way in which you can represent characters. All right, so again, this is a, a standard that was developed. Okay, uh, again, the short form is uh, S key, but it's called American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And this came about uh, because of computers, correct? When they came up with a keyboard, and you wanted uh, a standard way of representing all these characters on the keyboard, okay, to be transmitted, uh, they came up with this format. All right, so basically, there's seven bits plus one uh, parity bit. Okay, so we're not going to go into parity bit, but uh, I mean, probably you, you, you already have seen it or you, you will hear about it when you're talking about uh, uh, things like uh, security, okay, and uh, uh, cryptography and things like that. So it's, it's a way in which you want to uh, perform error correction or error detection to know whether there is any issue with the data being sent over. All right. Uh, but for now, we will just look at the seven bits. Okay. So basically, what happens is, uh, what this standard does is. It translates all the characters that you see on your keyboard to be represented with a seven bit uh, code. All right, and this seven bit code is basically what is transmitted the moment you press any character on your keyboard. And then the, the, the back end is now interpreting that as an ASCII code to print out the character that you are typing. Okay, so this is the full uh, ASCII table. Okay, it's a standard table. So as you can see, this is most significant bit and this is the least significant bit. Okay, so for example, if I want uh, the number or if I want a lowercase e, okay, this lowercase e will be represented as 110, why this is the most significant bit, followed by uh, 0101. 0101. So these are the seven bits that will be used to represent this uh, ASCII code for lowercase e. Okay, if I want to represent the number one, the number one is actually represented as, so this is your lowercase e. If I want the number one, it will be 0, 1, 1, followed by uh, 0, 0, 0, 1. So this is actually your number one. Okay, so every digit, okay, on your, on your keyboard is actually represented Okay, with a particular code. Okay, so that is what the ASCII table is for. All right, so in terms of C programming, okay, whenever you declare a variable, okay, so this is again something interesting in C. Okay, so if you look at this example, okay, uh, you have uh, two variables, okay, integer num and character ch. So for the number, you have key in and value 65, and for the character, you have key in as uppercase F. Okay, when I do a first printout here, okay, I'm printing it out as num as integer, so it comes out as 65, and I'm printing out uh, num as a character. So when I put the format specifier here as percentage C, what am I telling the program? I want the program to interpret this data that I'm sending it as a character. So even though I'm sending it num, which is an integer, declares an integer, it has a value of 65. Okay. Now, what is a value of 65? So you have to still remember this 65 is what base what? What is the uh, representation over here? Can anybody tell me? Is it base 2? Is it base 16? What is the base? is base 10, correct. So by default, all the numbers are always base 10. So 65 is base 10. Okay, but the ASCII table is in binary, correct? So let's let's do a, a, a easy translation first. Okay, using our calculator here. Okay, so I'm going to translate uh, 65 to binary. So in binary, it is 100001. Okay, one zero 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 one. So come back here. Okay, so what I have is one zero 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 one. So this is your MSB. 
So that is 100 zero zero and 0001 zero 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 is here. So that translates to capital A. Okay, so that is why. Okay, so that is why over here when I uh, print out the value 65 using percentage C as the format specifier, it interprets the value 65 based on the 7-bit binary that it reads, which in turn translates to capital A. Okay, now if you look at the next printout over here, what you have is CH, which is uppercase F, printed out using format specifier percentage C, it interprets it as F, okay, uppercase F. But at the same time, it also can be printed out using percentage D, so you will interpret the same ones and zeros as a actual value, a decimal value or an integer value. Okay, so uppercase F, if you come back here, is this value, all right? And this value here, if you key in your calculator, you get it as value 70. All right, so again, this comes back to the very important understanding we must have always that the data is always ones and zeros, all right? Only the programmer, okay, which is yourself, knows what those ones and zeros interpret. All right, so if, if I just look at this value in the memory, I look at it as ones and zeros. But this same value of ones and zeros, if I send it to a printout statement and I say print it out as an integer, it gives me 70. If I say it to the printout statement, I say print it out as a character, it gives me uppercase F. Okay, so the interpretation of what this data actually means to us is what we interpret it as. Okay, so it's our understanding. The computer just follows the instructions, right? Because if you say interpreting as integer, it prints out 70. Interpreting as character, it prints out F. Okay, so it is we, the programmer, who must understand what does it actually represent. Do I want to look at it as just once and zero? Do I want to look at it as an integer? Do I want to look at it as a character? Okay, so that is our interpretation. So that must always be correct. Then when we write the software, we know exactly how to look at this data. Okay, so that is, I think, the key takeaway we must have. Okay, so this is just a partial question. Okay, the answer is actually in a later slide, which you can always see. All right, where we have uh, a number that is defined over here okay, uh, to a variable n, and we have a loop that's supposed to run 10 times. And what we want to know is what is the output after I execute this code? All right, so this one, of course, we will get a better understanding when we cover the negative numbers part, okay? So I will leave this to next week's lecture, all right, so that we don't get too overloaded in the first class itself. All right, so uh, we will stop here for today. All right, uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, stay around and ask. If not, uh, uh, as I said, all of this will be uploaded uh, by, by tomorrow or so. So just uh, look out for my announcement, okay, with the links. All right, so any questions, you can uh, stay back, ask me. If not, thank you very much, okay? And I will uh, see you all next week.